more than I'd say 66, more than 65, certainly percent of people who get recruited, who join cults are recruited by a friend, a family member or a coworker. So there you have someone inviting you to something who is someone you know, it's much harder to say no to someone you know, right? Like even if your coworker is like, oh, come to this seminar, come to this seminar. And you're like, no, Joe, I don't want, and then after a while you're like, okay, Joe, I'll go, right? <laughs> so, um, Why are you making me the, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yanya Lalich is a cult expert. If you were to ask what makes her a cult expert, you could point to her doctorate in sociology, her three decades of research into the subject of cults, the fact that she's a professor emerita of sociology at the California State University. You could point to her several books on the topics of cults and systems of coercion, and if that's not enough, she used to actually be in a cult. She's had that experience of, of, of finding yourself being slowly manipulated and exploited by something that you think is a wonderful thing and then turn around one day and realize that your life and even your thoughts have been completely taken over and you just don't know how you got into the situation. But even worse, you don't know how to get out. That's some dark stuff. And while you can intellectualize how this happens, you, you can't really understand it unless you've been there. And I think that's what makes Dr. Lalich one of the top scholars in the world in this field, to the point that she gets called in to give expert testimony in court cases from time to time. And so when I started up this podcast, I wanted to talk to some interesting people. That was kind of the whole point. And Dr. Lalich was at the top of the list. Last year, I did a video on cults on my YouTube channel, and it is by far the longest video I've ever released on my channel, because even though I was only talking about five cults, I just couldn't stop finding just amazing facts that just had to go in there. This subject is just so fascinating. It's not just for the sensational true crime luridness of it, but because it points to something much deeper and fundamental about all of us. Like, how many times did I catch myself thinking, how did so many people get convinced of something so crazy and to such an extreme? And it doesn't take a great leap to see how whatever that is about people affects society at large. Like, we're all experiencing the same thing to a much smaller degree when you think about it. The topic of cults is like an onion. You just keep pulling back layers from it. And as I was researching this topic for the video, Dr. Lalich's name just kind of kept coming up over and over again. So yeah, she was one of the first people I reached out to when I said I wanted to do a podcast where I talked to interesting people. Yeah, she was right at the top of the list. By the way, quick little disclaimer, I kind of forgot to turn off some of the things on my computer that go ding from time to time. So you're going to hear some little noises. It's not your computer. You don't have to check your phone and freak out. It's uh, <laughs> it was it was my fault. I'm sorry about that. I'll be better next time. Sorry. And I want to thank Dr. Lalich for doing this and being so generous with her time. I really enjoy talking with her and I hope you enjoy it, too. So without any further ado, here was my conversation with Dr. Yanya Lalich. Before I talk for the next 30 minutes without letting you speak, how about I let you kind of tell everybody who you are and what you do and how you got into it and all that? Okay, sure. So my name is Yanya Lalich, and um, I'm a retired professor of sociology at one of the California State Universities. And I've been studying and writing about cults for about 35 years now. And I got into this because I myself was in a cult. Uh, when I was 30 years old, I had just moved to San Francisco after living on an island off the coast of Spain for four years. And don't ask me why I left. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, so I was kind of new in town and I got recruited and I've always been socially progressive. Anyway, I got recruited into a left wing political cult. And um, I was in that group for about 10 years and it was very restrictive and uh, harsh. And when I got out, um, I, you know, moved to New York and to get away from San Francisco and got some therapy and started doing a lot of research and writing because that's kind of just always been my orientation. And, um, and then after about 10 years, went to grad school, got my PhD and sort of made a, I mean, I wouldn't say it totally dominates my life, but I'd say at least one of my biggest life missions has been to help survivors and also to educate the public about cults. Mm -hmm. And that um, you, you use the word mission. And I was kind of curious if that's kind of how you saw it was like after, after you got out yourself, it was like, I want to keep other people from, from going through that. Or was it just that you, you came out of it and you're like, okay, what just happened? 
I have to figure this out and just kind of started researching it. And yeah, no, I got out and I was like, what the hell just happened? I mean, I was, I was 41 years old. I felt like I was 15. I was totally disoriented. I mean, and you know, there I was in New York, like this cultural Mecca and I had I'd seen maybe three movies in 10 years, and those were only ones that were approved by our leader. And so I felt like, you know, I was from Mars. I didn't know how to talk to people. I'd go on these business meetings and I'd say the most stupid things. And anyway, so after a while, um, I mean, it was actually, a, you know, and I'd spend nights like trying to write about the cult, trying to figure it out. And I'd be and I was drinking a lot and just trying to soothe the pain. And Mm -hmm. I mean, luckily, I had a job right away. Um, But what what sort of prompted me into therapy was that after six months of working for this guy um, in his direct mail business and his publishing business, he took me out to dinner for my six month anniversary. And he said, you know, Yanya, your work is great and I have no complaints and your writing is great and blah, blah, blah. But I have to say, you've been here six months and I've never seen you smile and I've never heard you laugh. Mm. And that completely blew me away. I had, I had no sense of my presentation of self, as we say in sociology. And so I was just like, oh my God, because I always kind of think of myself as a humorous person, you know? So that along with a some other incident prompted me to look for a therapist. And fortunately in New York at the time, there was a, a clinic that the cult clinic that um, the therapists there were trained in dealing with, you know, post cult after effects. Mm-hmm. And so that saved my life really. And that therapist saved my life. Um, I had a lot of, I had a lot of guilt and shame because I was in leadership and I did a lot of really shitty things. Oh, and, yeah. you know, and I was really trying to deal with, you know, how did I become that person and who am I? And, you know, all of that, just to unpack all of that. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so I was writing and then I started going to a cult awareness conferences and meeting people and wrote my first book in 94 um, which is Take Back Your Life, which was all about recovery. It's still been selling all these years. Um, and then, you know, because of grad school, did more writing, wrote more books. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> you just became the expert. Well, I imagine like when you were describing kind of working afterwards, I was I was imagining the, the kind of shame that a person must feel having... I bet it makes you question a lot of things about yourself and, and your own, yes. you know, gullibility or whatever. But um, but on top of that, like you said, you were in the leadership. So you actually kind of brought other people in, I assume. And, and so oh, and I was of one of the, on top of that. Yeah. I, I mean, I was one of the main brainwashers, so to speak. I mean, the, the leader had me develop a course um, to convince people that they wanted to be brainwashed, literally. And so um there was that and i was on the discipline and control board and you know created punishments for people and they actually called it that yes we called it that we were a hardcore you know communist group um so you know all of that afterwards i you know plus i cut off everybody from my life you know longtime Mm -hmm. friends and um and i would say guilt and shame even if you've not been in leadership is a really common issue for people when they get out of cults because everybody has been complicit in some way you have to be to be in the cult and so you've either done things or witnessed things that in your quote in any other circumstance you wouldn't have done so there's this you know what we call moral injury you know where your sense of morality has kind of been taken over by the immorality of the leader and the group Mm -hmm. and so afterwards it, it, it's really necessary to sort all that out so that you're not constantly bashing yourself in the head and trying to understand how did I get to that place what you know what was the indoctrination that got me to that place yeah wow so I, I've heard your story before and you can tell it here if you want to but about how your particular group dissolved itself you kind of voted yes. out the leader that sounds very unusual <laughs> It's very unusual. Yes. Um, So what happened is after about 10 years, you know, the the what we called the cadre or full time members was was down to about 120 people. And we had what we called stations of people around the country in various big cities. And 
um, things were getting more and more insane. I mean, the leader was an alcoholic and she was never even appearing anymore in front of people. Mm-hmm. I mean, people joined the group who'd never even met her or seen her. And, and, and we were all really, I would say, just strung out. We'd been working 18 hour days, day after day, year after year. Uh, and, and stuff started happening, you know, things that she wanted that were so completely irrational that, that those of us in the inner circle were like, what the hell, you know? Mm -hmm. So she was leaving the country to go to Bulgaria, which was her paradise at that time. (laughs) And um, while she was out of the country, we, you know, got everybody together um, and told them what was going on. Um, we had a big print shop that was one of the ways we earned money. And so everybody met in the print shop, and was, you know, piled in and we told them what was going on. And at first people didn't believe us. They thought we were just trying to like have a coup or something. And we're like, no, 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 this is what goes on. This is who she is, This is, you know. Mm. And so finally people believed us. And then it was like this pouring out of, you know, this kind of what in China they used to call the speak bitterness session. I mean, people were just like you know, telling the things they had lived through, you know, their husbands were expelled and they never knew what happened to them or Mm. they had to give away their kids in a divorce or, you know, all kinds of things, selling blood to have enough money to pay for the newspapers that we sold. And, you know, so that went on for a a couple of weeks and then she was coming back. So the night before she came back, we took a vote and we voted to expel her and to dissolve the organization. And that's what we did. Wow. So, yeah, and it was very unusual. And it was kind of funny because we, you know, even in the end like that, we were still following the, the same procedures that we would have done in the cult. You know, it's like mm-hmm. we had to have a vote. And we had to, and not that we ever had unanimous votes in the cult, not that we ever had votes in the cult. Everything was just her decision. But yeah. um, anyway, it was a very interesting period of time because then everybody got out. And so then we had to help each other, like get jobs and borrow oh, yeah. clothes and write resumes. And I ran the publishing house. So I, everybody said they worked at the publishing house and people would call me. I'd say, Oh yes, Susie works here. She's a great worker. You know? so, I mean, <laughs> You're all just, references yeah, for each other. Exactly. We just did whatever we could to help each other. So, hey, I stream, you stream, we all stream content from streaming services these days, but there's only one streaming service that offers the best documentary and educational programming in the known universe, and that is CuriosityStream. Which, by the way, is the perfect name for them because it's the streaming service for your curiosity. With thousands of titles to choose from, from history to futurism, science to art, whatever you're interested in, you can find it here. And by the way, it's not all just space and nerd stuff. I just found they have Winnebago Man on there, which is honestly one of my favorite documentaries ever. Yeah, you remember that viral video in the early days of the internet that was just like a behind the scenes compilation of this Winnebago salesman who just starts losing his mind throughout the day and screaming at everybody and dropping F-bombs? I think the title of the video was The Angriest Guy in the World or something like that. Anyway, somebody made a documentary about that guy and it is awesome. Uh, the idea is they wanted to know who this guy was and you know what going viral did for him. And, and the biggest question really is, why is, he, why is he this angry? Is he really this angry? And it turns out, yes, yes he is, absolutely that angry. And that entertaining. It's, it's, a, it's a funny and revealing documentary that I highly recommend. And I was just, I was super excited to see it on CuriosityStream. So lots to choose from. CuriosityStream will quickly become your favorite streaming service. And even better, it comes with what might become your second favorite streaming service, Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service created by some of your favorite YouTubers where you can see their videos ad-free and where they can feel free to experiment and try new things without the whole algorithm thing hanging over their heads. I'm on Nebula, actually, and it's the only place you can see my Nebula-exclusive series, Mysteries of the Human Body, where we delve into the weird and sometimes scary world of unexplained diseases. It's a fun time. Nebula's like our own little piece of the internet, and you're welcome to join us. And here's the crazy thing. Usually you can get 26% off for both services when you use my link, curiositystream.com slash Pod. But because it's the holidays, they've got a special deal going on until the 24th of this month, so it's limited time. You'll get not 26%. But 42% off a yearly subscription, meaning you'll get two streaming services for an entire year for $11.59. 
you probably spent more on that for coffee this morning. Like, I would spend that much just to watch Winnebago Man alone. So, yeah, you'd be crazy not to give this a go, especially if you've been on the fence about it. This is the cheapest I've ever seen it. So one more time, that's curiositystream.com slash Pod, and you can start streaming smarter. And thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this podcast. This podcast is also brought to you by Brilliant. Do you ever run across a problem and think it should be easy to figure out, but you just can't quite connect the dots? Have you ever been frustrated because you don't brain good? You might be experiencing debrainification. I know I have. But don't worry, internet friend. You can brain better with Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive online learning platform that teaches you STEM subjects in a way that engages your brain's natural problem-solving capability. It almost hacks your brain's inner superpower and uses it to explain complex topics in a way that makes sense to you and in a way that sticks so that you can apply that knowledge to other things in your life. You can start as basic as you want, like with their Math Fundamentals course, and work your way up to multivariable calculus, differential equations, and even competition math. Or start with a basic science fundamentals course and work your way up to quantum computing. Or just jump right into any of their 60 plus courses and if it's too far over your head, you know, just work your way back. It's also available on your mobile device so you can even take it offline. So maybe instead of spending hours mindlessly playing that game you're addicted to, you could spend that time learning the kind of stuff you never dreamed possible. And by the way, it makes a great gift for any kids that might be struggling with these courses in school. I know there were a lot of things that uh, I can never really pick up on in school that were made clear after just a few minutes on Brilliant. So, if you want to give it a try, you can get 20% off your premium subscription when you sign up at brilliant.org slash joescottpod. Once again, that's brilliant.org slash j-o-e-s-c-o-t-t-p-o-d. And if you're the curious type, you can actually take the first couple lessons of any of the courses for free to get a taste of what I'm talking about. And if you dig it, it's brilliant.org slash joescottpod. You get 20% off. Thanks for listening, and thanks to Brilliant for supporting the show. And now, back to the conversation. What I was wondering was, is there a time... Was there like a moment when you realized, okay, this is crazy and I got to get out? Or was it just kind of a slow progression of finding stuff out over time? Well, a part of it was being aware of stuff over time because I was in the inner circle and I had to participate in kind of insane gatherings with the leader, like on holidays and stuff. And she would be drunk and we'd have to sing songs and she would threaten the men to ha have sex with her and she would hit people. And I mean, it was, you know, they were awful. So that, that was something that really scared me. And I made up excuses to stop going to those. I would say, Oh, I'm sick or I'm this or I'm that. Um, but I still believed, you know, I thought, well, she's just under so much pressure. She's, you know, a crazy leader. And I, I literally used to think to myself, well, we have Stalin in our lineage, and at least we haven't killed anyone yet. I mean, that was my <laughs> rationalization. There's the silver lining. Right. <laughs> but then, And then one day she ordered someone killed, and I was like, oh, there goes that one. I mean, we didn't kill anyone, but... Um, but she was serious about it, though. No, yeah, but she was drunk. And fortunately, wow. the second-in-command knew she was drunk. We were in Yugoslavia with her at the time at a conference, and she called back to the second-in-command and said, have so-and-so killed... And fortunately, Rosa, who was the second in command, clearly realized she was drunk. And, you know, the yeah. next morning she forgets she says all these things. So uh, but, you know, I didn't know for the rest of the trip. I was so worried, like, oh, my God, I want, you know, anyway. So that that kind of thing was shocking and traumatizing and jarring. But the, the final thing that broke me was my mother. This is a, kind of a long story, but my mother uh, was back in Milwaukee and she got a brain tumor mm -hmm. and I borrowed money to go there and be in the hospital. And she had her surgery and the doctor said, well, it was, it's a glioblastoma and it'll grow back and she'll probably have four to six months to live. Um, even if we take it out, it'll just grow right back. So they did take it out. And uh, she was in the hospital and had to go through all the, you know, occupational therapy and speech therapy and all that. And mm -hmm. and then it was time the, the hospital, the hospital was kicking her out. You know, at a certain point you have to leave. And she really had nowhere to go. So I called back home to the organization and said, I'd like a leave of absence. I'd like to stay here and take care of my mom for four months or whatever. And then I'll be back. So my leadership, who was the second in command, checked with, you know, the God and called me back the next day and said, oh, we have a great idea. Bring your mom out to California. 
So like a good soldier, that's mm -hmm. what I did. My poor mom, who was, you know, a little old Serbian lady who'd probably been outside of Milwaukee once in her life. So I brought her to California. One of my roommates moved out. She moved in with us. And, um, and then I never got to see her because I worked all the time. So I said, look, you had me bring my mom on. I don't know. So finally they said, oh, well, okay, you can have dinner with her, 45 minutes for dinner. So I'd run home and have dinner with her for 45 minutes. And then they decided she should work for the cult. So they said she could work at one of our front group offices. We, we had a front group called the Grassroots Alliance, which was about voter issues and stuff. And so she was going to work there doing filing. I mean, God knows the woman had just had half her brain cut out. Right. And she, mm -hmm. you know, wore a tight hat around her head because she was bald and, you know, she was out of it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. someone picked her up every day and she worked at the at the office. So I wasn't seeing her again. Um, and then what happened is so she had been been with with me there for about, I'd say, about six weeks. And then in mid-July, I came home one evening at 11 o'clock and found her dead in her bedroom. Mm -hmm. And it just broke me. And I was yeah. like, oh, my God. So my best friend came over and the coroner came and all of that. And, and then I called my leadership, Rosa, again. And I said, my mom just died and I'm flying the body home. And, um, you know, I just want you to know. And she said, on the other end of the line, she said, well, you're not going to Milwaukee for the funeral, are you? And I just snapped. And I yeah. thought, here I bad. am killing myself 20 hour days, all these years to build a better world. And if this is the better world we're building that I'm told I can't go to my mother's funeral who just mm -hmm. died in my house, then I don't want any part of it. So it was the first time I defied the organization. I borrowed money again. I flew home. I organized the funeral. I don't even remember how I did it. I don't remember anything about the funeral. Uh, afterwards, there was a big dinner in the Serbian hall, which was our tradition. And, you know, her sisters, my aunts came and everybody, and old neighbors. All. And halfway through, I got up and left because I was terrified that I had defied the organization. And I got a night flight back to San Francisco. And the next day I was criticized in front of all of the leadership for putting my mother ahead of the revolution. So after, and then I'd have to go around to all the meetings and I was like the example of what you're not supposed to do. And mm -hmm. so that broke me. And I knew I, I, I no longer believed, I no longer wanted to be part of it, but I could not figure out how to leave. And that happened in the summer of 1981. And the ending that we had wasn't until late 1985 or six. So five oh, years, wow. I lived in I lived in total misery. I was I would get up every morning and take a shower and just cry and cry and cry because we were never allowed to cry. We had to have no emotions. And I would get in my car to drive to the facility where I worked and um, for the party, and I would wish that I'd be killed in a car accident because it was the only way I could see to get out. And this was five years or so. I was like a wow. walking nervous breakdown. I mean, I, I was so miserable, but I was terrified to leave. I, I knew they'd come after me. I had nowhere to go. I had no money. I had a broken down car that wouldn't have made it over the Bay bridge. I had no friends on the outside. Now both my parents were dead. I was completely I would say paralyzed with fear, you know, mm -hmm. and then there was still one tiny little part of me that would think, well, maybe I'm, you know, maybe it is me, maybe I'm selfish, maybe I'm wrong, you know? Um, yeah, it was. And I think so many people in cults live under that kind of stress yeah. and that kind of fear. Um, being in a cult is really not a lot of fun. <laughs> Well, I, I really thank you for sharing that. I, I'm sure it's still not easy to talk about, but no. um, I think that really paints a very visceral picture of what it's like to be so stuck. I mean, yes. I've had I've had jobs where I was that miserable, maybe not that miserable, but I've, I've had jobs where I was miserable. But even even just with the job, I felt like after, you know, being there for a certain amount of time, it's like, I don't know what else to do. I don't know how to get mm -hmm. out of this job. 
Mm-hmm. If you if you leave the job, you got to have something to take its place. And right. You know, or if you have a good paying job, is somebody going to match that salary? Like, oh, now I've bought a house. I have house yeah. payments. You know, there's like, yeah. Those and you have all the friends at the job and all that. I mean, that, right. that's like a sliver of what you're talking about. But I think everybody can identify with that on some level, mm-hmm. but just hype it up by a power of 100 or something like that. A million. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but what you were saying uh, earlier about that there was a, a revolution, there was a mission. Um, there's a phrase that I've heard said in multiple places by uh, well, in like documentaries and stuff that I've been watching, where they say nobody joins a cult. Yeah. You know, they they join a really great thing that makes you feel good, and then it turns out to be you know right. this. Right. I mean, in most cases, you have you really don't know the bottom line of what you're getting into. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there is. There's always some level of deception, you know, deceit, holding back, Um, because if you knew you wouldn't, I mean, who would join something, you know, where you're going to work 20 hour days and not see your family and, you know, so it's, it's the subtlety of the recruitment process. Um, And yeah, you know, you think, oh, I mean, when I joined mine, I was like, oh, wow, this sounds great. These people are really serious. We're really going to, you know, make some political change and, and, you know, we we were for, you know, a revolution, but we didn't think the revolution would happen in our lifetime. I mean, we thought we were martyrs for the cause. Mm-hmm. So believing that you're martyrs for the cause is a justification for the misery. I mean, she right, used to yeah. really say, I never told you this was a tea party. You know, Chairman mm-hmm. Mao said the revolution isn't a tea party. You know, I told you this would be hard. Of course, you're going to work hard. This isn't about being happy. And so, you know, that all works on you to sort of just keep suffering through it. And I'm, mm-hmm. I know it's the same in many, many other cults, whether they're, you know, they don't need to be political. They don't need to be religious. You know, there's every kind of cult. That was something that really, um, again, just one thing after another blew me away when I was like researching this whole topic. But I, I mean, I imagine like anything that can give you that feeling of this is going to make my life better or it's going to make the world better. This is the answer I've been looking for. And that could be self-help. That could be an MLM. That can be exactly religious, political. Like it, it, there's so many yeah. different kinds. Psychotherapy, karate. I mean, <laughs> you know, and and sometimes you maybe weren't even looking for it, but you kind of get convinced you were looking for it, mm. you know. Um, but it really is that, um, you know, I mean, I, I get asked all the time, like, is there a personality profile of someone who gets in a cult? And I'd say after all these years and all the people I've known and met, and if there's any common denominator, it's idealism. Right. Mm -hmm. It's people who in some way want to better the world, better their family, better themselves, you know, better their workplace, better their bank account, whatever it is. It's some form of idealism. Mm -hmm. And the important thing is that the the message of the cult or the cult leader or the recruiter has to resonate with you. Mm -hmm. Right. It has to be something that would appeal to you. So uh, I always say, and I know people are probably sick of me hearing, hearing me say this, but, you know, I always say I never would have joined a meditation cult because I can't sit still that long. Right. (laughs) But a political cult that was going to change the world. Well, I was absolutely a ripe target for that. Right. So the message has to resonate with you. Um, And then, you know, it just takes skilled recruiters to draw you in. And it's a process. Mm -hmm. These things don't happen overnight. You know, I think that Early on, there was this idea that, you know, people looked at you and drew you in and you were suddenly they did the brainwashed. Voodoo. You know, but it's a process. The recruitment's a process. The indoctrination's a process. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes it almost, that makes it more insidious to me. Because <laughs> idealism is a good quality. It's a good trait to have. Exactly. People, We need people that want to, you know, make yeah. the world better in some pe- way. It's good right. people who get into cults. Yeah. I mean, it's people who, and, and they're you like know, weaponizing I, that in a way. Exactly. And, and you know, over the years, I think cults have gotten savvier. And of course, there are more types of cults, but I'd say the majority of people being recruited today are not young people. It's people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, right? Either through some goofy program that their business sent them to, and there's so many business cults. And then, Mm. of course, the wellness industry, the fitness industry. And, you know, cults want people who have skills, who, who perhaps have money, who have connections, who they can bring in either as more recruits or in some way to lend legitimacy to the group, right? 
I mean, they don't want stupid, lazy, crazy people, you know, which I think is one of the myths about who gets into a cult. They want those type A personalities because they want you to run the business, recruit, you know, do because the cult leaders, they don't do much. They're pretty lazy, you know, so they want hardworking people who are honest and they're going to change that your sense of honesty. But that's who they're looking for. Mm-hmm. You, you talk about like idealism being like a personality trait that's easily manipulated, I suppose. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's a factor of it. I wonder, um, and I was going to ask, is it sort of like a place in your life that, I mean, like life circumstances, like people who are kind of a little bit lost or looking for an answer for yeah, things? It's, I mean, it's, it, I think life circumstances is certainly part of it. I mean, it's... <laughs> It's that you are at a, some point in your life where you're open to checking something out for some reason or other. So it could be, you know, you're at a new job, you're in a new town you just moved to, you just graduated from school, you just got divorced, right? Your dog just died. You know, it's raining out today, you know, and you feel, <laughs> right? So you see something on the internet or you see in the old days, you saw a little thing on the bulletin board, you know, Um and so there is there are those moments which we call vulnerabilities, but they're not they're not vulnerabilities in the sense that there's something wrong with you, because mm-hmm. we all have these moments millions of times in our lives. Sure. So there, there typically is this kind of connection of you're in that moment. Somebody comes along that sounds interesting. But the other important factor is that more than I'd say 66, more than 65, certainly percent of people who get recruited, who join cults are recruited by a friend, a family member, or a coworker. So there you have someone inviting you to something who is someone you know. It's much harder to say no to someone you know, right? Like even if your coworker is like, oh, come to this seminar, come to this seminar. And you're like, no, Joe, I don't want, and then after a while, you're like, okay, Joe, I'll go, right? <laughs> so, um, Why are you making me the, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> come on. Uh, <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah, that, yeah. it's that familiar. It's and you go and you think, oh, you know, well, if, if so-and-so's, if my uncle Harry's doing it, it can't mm. be all that bad. I guess I'll go check it out, you know, and then boom. You know, if you're spotted as a potential recruit, they're going to what we call love bomb you. You know, they're going to make mm. you feel special and oh, interesting and oh, your clothes are so sharp or whatever it is. And that is another influence technique that makes you feel obligated to respond back. So they've been so nice to you. And then when they ask you to come back, you're like, OK, I'll come back. You've been so nice to me. And it goes like that. Yeah. So yeah. what you know what cults are doing are are they're using basic social psychology, basic influence techniques, and that's why people don't see the red flags right away because mm-hmm. it's things we're used to. But it's used as a manipulation, and it's um, coordinated these coordinated techniques that work to draw you in further and further. It's it's interesting to me because I have an advertising background and uh, like branding. Oh yeah. There's there's a lot of the Venn diagram is pretty thick, <laughs> and, and the things that are they're similar between them in terms of just like the psychological. It, yeah, it's manipulation it's the same is the right word for it. I yeah. guess. Yeah, yeah. It's the it's the art of persuasion, right? Mm-hmm. There was a book about that years ago. I mean, it's it's prop it's basically propaganda, um, and you know, people even if they if they kind of sense a red flag. Unfortunately, they don't listen to their gut and yeah. and they put it aside. I mean, I did it. You know, everyone yeah. does it. I I got a I signed up for a, a productivity course. I won't say the name because I'm not trying to cast shade or whatever, but um it was it it was super culty. And I just like immediately was going, I don't know about this. Cause it was like the, the, the head guy who ran it, everybody just talked about him in glowing terms. Mm-hmm. Like you, you thought he was going to have a halo around him whenever he exactly. pop, popped up on screen. And everybody talked about how this productivity thing changed their lives and they used to be this and now they're successful and all this, but, but it was just like this overwhelming praise for the main guy. Right. 
right. that just everybody was just laying it on super thick. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll take what I need from this course and then get the hell out of here. Cause this, <laughs> this, this is really creepy, but yeah. that, but that kind of gets to something I wanted to talk about was what are some red flags that people should keep an eye out for when, cause I don't want people to feel like they can't join groups to better themselves, you know, like that's, right. that's a right. good resource if they, right. you know, well, I, I, you know, I think, I think if people saw it as, you know, being good consumers and approaching mm -hmm. it like they would buying a car, right? You don't buy the first car you look at, right? You drive it around, you ask people who own that car, you might read the consumer's reports, whatever, right? You read the reviews online. So unfortunately, when people s sort of get involved in these groups, they, they often rush right into it. And part of that is the pressure of the recruitment process, you know, like, oh, yeah, you, you know, you, they're only doing this now for this price or this guru is only going to be here this week or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So they there is that pressure to do it now. But if people slow down is one thing I think that could be done. And also if people did their research, you know, there's a massive amount of information online today criticizing a lot of these groups or at least, you know, people sharing their experiences. Um, and then also, I think just simple things like, you know, if everybody is worshiping the head of whatever it is, you know, what's that about? You know, mm -hmm. is, is it possible to criticize that person? Is there transparency related to the money? Um, is there transparency about decision making? Um, and often, and it's important to be alert that often in these cases, you may ask questions like that. And the question will get turned back on you and they'll say, oh, you know, you don't you ha you haven't, you know, been to the next session yet. You know, come to the next session and then ask us that question. You know, it's mm -hmm. like you're not informed enough yet to ask that question. And they do that so that by the time you go to the next thing, you've forgotten what the question was. Right. And they've got right. you in a little deeper. Yeah. So I think it's really important to, um, to, you know, to ask to speak to people who um, haven't been happy with it, you know critics what are the critics saying and um and just really keep your eyes open about whether there is that kind of fawning over the leader you know wh whether you get invited to something and they say oh well i'm not going to tell you what happens you have to just experience it mm -mm, mm -hmm. don't do that um and then the other thing is many of these especially these self-help programs have you sign a waiver before you go that you won't hold them responsible if something happens to you mm -hmm. If you're being asked to sign a waiver like that, it's probably likely something is going to happen to you. Yeah, <laughs> and there's so a there's a reason they're asking you to sign that yeah. waiver. And it's also because probably in the past there were lawsuits against that group. So that's an, to me, that's another red flag. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to anything where they make me sign a waiver. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think keeping those kinds of things in mind um, may help people from rushing into these things. It's it's really it's fascinating to me how they they tend to follow the same playbook. I mean, mm -hmm. am I right in saying that, or is that? Oh yes, and in, in my okay. book, take take back your life, in the in the chapter about the leaders, we we talk about it, it looks like they all go to the cookie cutter messiah school, right? <laughs> so well, so they, that that's my question though. Like, where do they learn this, or is it just something they all stumble into accidentally, and it's just a function of their malignant narcissism? Yeah, it just I kind think of flows from that. Yeah, I think it's a. I think they they um, they happen to be skilled at at persuasion. Mm -hmm. um, they may be charming people or come across to some people as charming. I mean, it's important. This whole idea of charisma. It's important to remember that charisma is in the eye of the beholder. Right? Somebody you might think is charismatic, I might think is a total creep. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's that personal relationship. Once you attribute charisma to somebody, they have power over you. But the but the people who are the leaders of these groups are are typically, like you said, narcissists. Uh, some of them have also psychopathic or sadistic tendencies, mm -hmm. like Keith Raniere, the guy who headed ne the Nexium cult. Yeah, that's kind of the big um, one in the in the news these days. Yeah. Yeah, and then. Um, you know, they 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 are good at persuasion and all, all they all they really need to do is get one or two followers because it's those people who are then going to recruit more people. Right. Yeah. Um, and like I said, they're using, you know, they're using basic social psychology and they're they're people who maybe are natural 
manipulators. You know, a lot of them were con artists. Um, and they're just, you know, sleazy characters, you know, who, mm -hmm. who put a robe on and pretend they're someone else, right? And so, um, yeah, I don't, you know, I, and, it's, and, and there are women as well. I'd say the majority are men but of these cult leaders, but there are certainly women as well. And uh, they know how to push your buttons. You know, they seem to have that ability to read people in a way. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, so in a sense, they all look alike when you kind of take away the trappings um, because they're, they're master manipulators is sort of what they are. Yeah. Well, in the case of the Keith Ranieri and the, the Nexium, I mean, the, uh, like you said before, they're, they're lazy. They want everybody to serve them. So he had this like whole layer of mostly women that yeah. were recruiting and, and doing all the, the work for him and stuff. That, exactly. that's, that's another part of it that, that gets me is like, it's, it's not just that they've built this group, it's that they've built a group that does all the work for them. Right. Like they're not like, like you know, Charles Manson never killed anybody. Exactly. No. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or Charles Diedrich from Synanon. You know, it was the other mm. guys who put the snake in the mailbox of the of the attorney. Right. The rattlesnake in the mailbox story. I don't you think know? I know that one. What's that story? So Synanon was one of the first sort of encounter group um, uh, drug rehab programs. Oh, okay. And it was super popular in the 60s. And so everybody was kind of involved in Synanon or offshoots of Synanon. And today, you know, there is what what we call the troubled teen industry, which are the, all these boarding schools and wilderness programs. Many of those come out of the Synanon tradition, where they use this confrontational, what we call attack therapy. I think you know, I heard about this, where they would like take them out into the woods where they can't yes, get exactly. out. And yeah, the okay, yeah. I, have, I saw yeah. a video about that. So a lot of that is is. Um, descendants of Synanon, where they would put someone in the hot seat and criticize them. And anyway, Synanon was led by this guy named Charles Diederich, and they were headquartered in, in uh, California. And there were a number of parents and mainly grandparents who were concerned about their their offspring who were getting involved with Synanon and weren't allowed to see them. And so there was a lawyer in Los Angeles who um, was sort of representing a lot of these grandparents and winning some suits and um they didn't like him of course so charles diederich said to his he had the this sort of bodyguard force that he called the marines or something and he told them to go and take care of of this lawyer and they went and put a rattlesnake in his literally a live rattlesnake in his mailbox and when he came home that evening after work and put his hand in his mailbox to get the mail, he was bitten by the rattlesnake and, you know, still today has a has a deformed hand from Nobody that experience. Survived. Yeah. Yeah. He did Oof. survive. Um, but of course, Charles Diederich, no charges against him. He yeah. didn't do it just like Charlie Manson. Well, that's interesting. I mean, like, how do you how do you legally what are the legalities there? Like, how do you like nail these guys? Aren't, isn't it usually on things like tax evasion or something like yeah, that? Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's really the, the rub when it comes to trying to hold them accountable. I mean, that was what was so brilliant about the case against Ranieri because yeah. th those folks um, gathered so much evidence um, that they find, I mean, people tried for years to bring charges against him and law enforcement would never respond. And finally, they had enough evidence and they had enough cachet having Catherine Oxenberg involved, who was this, you know, well-known actress, that finally the FBI got interested and they were able to file federal charges, you know, of sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And, you know. But the problem is that, that, that um, you know, cults per se are not illegal entities. It's the things that they do. Right. And so to hold them accountable, you need to have evidence of those things, of the fake corporations, the tax evasion, the, you know, whatever it might be, the traffic, the, you know, almost every cult is labor trafficking because people work for free or for nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and the, one of the main problems is today that the courts don't yet, or law enforcement doesn't yet quite get this whole idea of coercion. Um, and so, so many times someone will call the authorities and they'll say, I, I'm working with a guy right now whose wife 
has given oh, close to half a million dollars to some bizarre energy worker, right? And he tried to get the authorities to look at him. And they came back to him and said, look, your wife is 43 years old. She's giving the money of her own free will. Right. What are we going to do about it? So that's why there is today a real push among, among a certain segment of this field that I'm in who are trying to get the courts to understand coercion and, and what it means to be doing things against your will, yeah. um, even though it looks like you're doing it willingly. And, or you may even say, I'm doing this willingly. Um, yeah, well, how's, so how's that going, that, that effort? It's tough. I mean, it, it's actually, they passed that law in the UK. Um, it, right now, it only applies to domestic violence situations, but they're trying to expand it. And then we have people here working on that as well. But it'll be a battle, um, you know, just like getting people aware about domestic violence. Look what that took, you know, mm. um, how many years did the police go to a house and then just turn around and walk away, yeah. you know, until yeah. they got trained um, or just like today, we're doing training about human trafficking to to the people who work in the airline industry, to law enforcement, to the first responders. So we need to do the same kind of work uh, in the cult world. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. Um. The word cult, mm -hmm. is that a word that you, because you're using it a lot right now, but I mean, I also hear like high control group being used a lot more. Mm -hmm. Is it just yeah. because like that word can be kind of damaging or it's, it's it kind of automatically well, puts a, a thought in people's minds that it's a certain thing? Well, it there's a long history to that. And some of that has to do with... Um, there's a there are a group of academics who who we call cult apologists who are who are um, primarily scholars of religion or sociologists of religion and they basically defend the cults uh, they go to court to defend I mean they try to keep people like me from testifying in court cases hmm. they um, they do campaigns to the journalists to say don't use the word cult and don't use the word brainwashing and so they they started out saying, well, you know, using the word cult has a, you know, has a negative context. Um, and, and they're the ones who actually, I think, really promoted that. But, um, you know, we call gangs gangs. So let's call cults cults. You know, there's a long history of understanding what these groups are in sociology, in psychology, in anthropology, you know, and to deny to deny the use of that word is i think unfortunate but i think over time a number of people have started using other words like high control group or high demand group um which i think is a little problematic and because you know you can say i'm in a soccer club and it's a high demand group right I, we do exercises all the time we do practices you know yeah, you gotta work so out every what day. Is, yeah what does that mean a high demand group um where I think when you use the word cult as as it should be understood, you know, it means a group where there's a certain degree of manipulation and exploitation going on and, and taking advantage of the members of that group. Um, so I stick with the word. I don't care. <laughs> I've been sued a few times. Yeah. I got through it. Uh, they lost. <laughs> you know, so I well, just I've, think I've heard that know, like um people might use the word cult to describe a certain poli or a religious group that they don't like. Well, but, but, but people might use that word as, as a way of, as a, as a justification for like violence against that group or something. Um, you know, I suppose that happens. I don't know. I don't, I, I, I guess if we had, if you had some specific, specific examples, we could talk about that, but, um, you know, we can look at the Branch Davidian example, right? Sure. The Waco, right? So they were told that they were um, hoarding arms, you know, they were arming themselves. So they went in to investigate. That was, a, that was justifiable. And in fact, they were. Now, what happened was horrible. And, you know, unfortunately, things probably went a little wrong, on, uh, certainly 
I'm not saying the FBI or the ATF or whoever did exactly the right thing. Yeah. But come on, Koresh could have let his people out. You know, mm -hmm. I hold him as the one accountable for for those deaths. Or you look at what happened in Jonestown. I mean, the, the congressman went there to investigate and people wanted to leave. And that was, you know, that was not acceptable to Jones. Yeah. And they'd been practicing those suicides for, yeah. for a long time. You know, fake ones, but they, they called them white knights and they were drills. Like, mm -hmm. if this happens, are you going to drink the potion? So are these actions justifiable? In most cases, yes. Um, certainly the term shouldn't just be thrown at any old group so that we can go and invade them. But I'm not sure there's a whole lot of examples of that really happening. There, there's definitely a line drawn between a religious group and somebody that gets into a compound and arms yeah. themselves with a whole battalion worth of armory. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like the, yeah, the, uh, the cult now that's run by Sean Moon. You know, the son of one of Reverend Moon, Reverend Moon of the Moon Organization. Is that the guy that wears the, the crown of bullets? And yeah, stuff? the crown of bullets, Sean yeah. Moon. I mean, that's a really dangerous situation. You've got all these people who are who are told to buy AR-15s, to be part of the church, you buy an AR-15. Well, who needs an AR-15? But then you've got all these inexperienced people running around with AR-15s. Yeah. And then they just bought a whole bunch of land in Tennessee, and they're lining up with the far right groups and the proud boys and people like that. I mean, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Is, that, is so, that one of them that you're most concerned about? I, I have concerns about that for the, for the coming period, especially given the state of things in our country right yeah. now and the polarization. So yeah. yeah, that's a concern. Well, I made a statement and I would like to have you tell me if I was correct in this assertion. Um, at the end of my video, I was talking about how, well, just, I was just looking back at the five that I had picked again, just by body count. And it, it seemed to me like there was, um, you know, Jonestown and, and the, the Mansons that I, I didn't include the Mansons, but like that was in the late sixties, early seventies time of a lot of turmoil and upheaval in society. Um, a lot of them took place in the, the late 90s as the millennium was approaching. That kind of surprised me because I lived through that and I didn't really notice there being a big cult thing going on. But <laughs> I, was, I was basically making the argument that we are living right now in a time of a lot of social upheaval and it's, it's ripe for cults to form. Absolutely. Is that, do, you, do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. When societies are in turmoil, the cults can do very well. Because people are at a loss or they're looking yeah. for a framework to understand what the hell's going on. You know, I think that's why during the pandemic, that's why so many people got caught up in QAnon and all the whole anti-vax thing and all that, because mm -hmm. they had all this time to spend on the computer. They couldn't leave their house. And like, so, and they're like, what the hell's going on? Like, is it Armageddon? Right. So people, yeah. you know, when people are distressed, um, I mean, that's what happened in Eastern Europe when the Iron Curtain fell. And all these countries were in upheaval. Um, yeah. Mm. Well, okay. So that leads me to something I really wanted to bring up, which was um, I know that generally we talk about cults as having like a charismatic, strong leader. Um, but now social media has kind of yeah. become a whole thing. And I feel like we're kind of brainwashing ourselves with the help <laughs> of the algorithm and stuff, you know? Um and the fact that we're seeing, I mean, let's, let's just go there, I guess, politically, um, you know, the, the QAnon thing, like you were talking about, um, I, I found it interesting. <laughs> I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to wear my politics on my sleeve for just one second. I usually keep it pretty, pretty close to my chest, but, um, in that video, I got a lot of comments from people that were saying BLM and Antifa and the Democrats are a cult that I didn't list in there, you know? <laughs> and when I saw that, it made me think of one of the documentaries I saw about Heaven's Gate. And there was a, a, I guess a scene where they were coming back from having done one of their little seminars and they were all in a van together and it was shot on a home movie camera. So like it was them recording it. And they were kind of laughing at the people that were at the seminar who didn't believe them. Mm-hmm. 
who they couldn't get to, you know, convert or whatever. And they were like, these guys are just, they're all so brainwashed. And they're, it's like, they're all, you know, in a cult or something, you know? And it was kind of like, <laughs> <Duh. laughs> um, who's the one in the cult here? You know? Um, but it's, it's been a really weird time in the last few years, especially, but I guess ever since social media happened, that it's, it's, people have just really gotten more polarized and, uh, and it's starting to, feel like and I didn't I, I've been using the word cult but then at the same time you know there's there's people that say that they're losing their family members to mm -hmm. QAnon and MAGA mm -hmm. and that kind of thing and and that they can't you know talk to them anymore and um I know there's been situations in my own extended family where um you know people just can't talk about anything else right and um I don't I didn't know if that qualified as a cult because there's not specifically I mean obviously Trump is the charismatic leader of that group but um QAnon doesn't really have a leader does it or well here here's my understanding of what's going on okay <laughs> um, <laughs> um the combination of and and I guess I'll just be blunt the combination of Trump's presidency um, and some of the economic situations for some people mm. and the pandemic uh, to all together created this sort of uncertainty for Americans. The most, I think, the most insidious part of it that had the most impact was Trump. And I believe that he created a, a, a polarization of, of this country that we've never seen before. So that you, you do have people, you do have this um, us versus them mentality that we see in cults, right? And people are very polarized. And like you say, if somebody can't come to Thanksgiving dinner anymore. Or if they come, it's just a disaster, right? Because it, it's no longer like, oh, well, you know, my uncle Harry thinks that, but he's a great guy. We still go fishing together. No, now it's like, you're either with me or against me, yeah. you know, and if you're against me, I'm going to shoot you. And so yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, Trump created this really polarized situation and also favored the groups on the right and the white supremacists so that the hate that was boiling there, festered, mm -hmm. and those fringe groups who until then really didn't have much cachet, right? It was like, oh yeah, there's the white supremacy, you know, they do things now and then, but but now here they had the in a sense, they had the blessing of a high political official. So suddenly they're kind of like, oh, these are groovy guys. I think I'll maybe I'll hook up with them, mm -hmm. right? So they had they finally had a national presence and a national recognition. So I think what we're seeing is kind of a new form of cult in a way. We're seeing these cults on a national scale, which we've never seen in our country before. And a great deal of that has to do with the internet and the algorithms and people being shunted down these rabbit holes, right? Um, and we don't have exactly the the physical presence of a leader per se. I mean, I guess there was some guy and his son who headed QAnon in the beginning or something. I don't know, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. Uh, so th this idea of the charismatic leader is now shifting because we've got these amorphous virtual communities where people are finding the same sense of belonging mm -hmm. and comradeship and they're adopting the same language and they're we wearing the same t-shirts and the hats with the slogans and mm -hmm. um and sometimes they surface and have rallies and sometimes they surface and charge upon the capital right um so there's a level of of hate and violence that yeah. wasn't part of the cult world so much before now um, until now what i what i now call the brick and mortar cults right the cults where we knew where the headquarters was we knew who the leaders was yeah. we knew where their centers were for the most part i mean sometimes they were secretive but mostly we knew where they were 
now we have this this amorphous thing that we can't quite put our fingers on that have kind of a rotating leader. You know, one day it's some guy who's hosting a talk show and then he mm-hmm. dies of COVID. So then somebody else steps up, right? Yeah. So, um, so it's a very, um, it's a very ethereal kind of environment, um, but people are very wedded to it. And it's really, and like you say, it's really difficult it, the same kind of difficulty we had talking with people in the run of the mill cults, you know, mm-hmm. people are having now with their friends or family members. Um, and so it's, a, it's a new way of understanding uh, w- what's happening. And unfortunately it's at least in our country. And I think in a lot of countries right now, you know, there's this shift to the right that that's pretty scary. You know, I think it's well, it, authoritarianism as well. It's yeah, authoritarianism. I mean, and it's, you know, it's creeping upon us. <laughs> and so I think, um, you know, it needs it needs different measures than we've used in the past. Um, How exciting to be living in the golden age of cults. <laughs> I'll tell you, I've never been busier. I mean, you know, trying to schedule right. with me. I mean, I, I can go morning, noon and night, either talking to podcasters or journalists or families in crisis or somebody who's leaving a group and needs help. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. been amazing. Um, Well, I mean, that that might be a good place to kind of start to wrap things up. Like um, all these people that say that they've lost a family member to um, MAGA or or QAnon or whatever. Um, What do you do? Like, I I know that you can't tell them they're in a cult because that just makes them dig in further, right? Exactly. Yeah. I think, and I know this sounds naive perhaps, but, and it's the same way we tried to work with people in cults. Um, You can't be confrontational and you can't challenge them and you can't think that you have the best argument. It's not about arguing them out of it. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is to, is to stay connected in whatever way you can. Don't cut them off. I mean, they might cut you off, but don't you cut them off (laughs) and um, and try to when if you have the opportunity to speak with them or be with them to really talk about other things, you know, talk about good times you had together. Talk about, you know, the last time you all went to Hawaii or I don't know, whatever it is, like like Mm -hmm. regenerate their their emotions and their heartstrings that have to do with this world and not that world. Yeah. And you might want to very gently, gently, gently ask a few questions, you know, to find out, maybe find out more about what drew the person to that. What, you know, was it that they didn't feel respected in their family or their, or they were bullied in school, you know, mm-hmm. but the main thing is to stay away from, from any kind of intense discussion and really just be what I say is be a safe haven for that person be someplace that when they finally decide they want to make a change, they can come to you and you're not going to humiliate them or criticize them. You're not going to say, see, yeah. I told you so. You should never. Condescending you know? to them. Yeah. 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 You just want to like, let them chill out, let them sleep, let them talk if they want to talk, but don't be pushy and let them know that you're that place, you know, um, because it's, the, it's hard to break from one of those situations, from a cult or whatever it is these things are. Yeah. It's because it's your whole identity is wrapped up in it's it. An and so you're thing. giving up yeah. your you're giving up your worldview. Yeah. And that's not easy. Um, it's scary to do that. So I think I you- saw uh, I've talked about this before, but the, uh, there was a study where they did fMRI scans of people's brains and showed them images that challenged their identities and their worldviews and the same areas lit up as if they were in physical pain. Mm-hmm. Like, like your identity is, is, is very much a, a, a physical part of you. Yeah. And when you challenge that, it's like somebody's literally punching you. And, and yeah. that's, yeah. that's how we get, you know, into our corners like that. Exactly. Exactly. So um, it almost feels like, you know, what you said a second ago, like you're right. Like just, we always go immediately to politics all the time. Like it used to be, don't talk politics or religion at the dinner table. And now it's just <laughs> always, always, always politics. Just see what was on the news. And, you know, and, um, I'm, I'm trying really hard to just, even when I'm with friends that I agree with right, politically, just like, just, just 
set it down for a minute. You know, let's let's just, you know, don't you have some embarrassing story from the last time you got drunk that we can talk about? You know? <laughs> I agree with you. I, you know, I, I don't know if I should even say this publicly, but I stopped watching the news about five months ago. I don't watch the news at all. I, mm. f for one, I didn't want to hear about Trump anymore. And that's all they seem to talk about still. Yeah. And and it was just, it you know, it made me miserable. So I get alerts on my phone from the New York Times or whatever, you know, various news alerts. But spending hours watching, you know, some news program talk, I'm, I, I just don't do it. And I'm so much happier. <laughs> and I feel like I'm still aware of what's going on in the world, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, but I don't want to talk about that all the time. You know, I want to, I want to work on solutions. I don't want to be miserable hearing, you know, the latest horror story that happened in the government. Anyway. I, I hadn't really, I, I live in the YouTube world now, so I guess that's where I get most of my news, which sounds terrible, but <laughs> I like to think that I'm varied about it. Um, but like my, my wife had kind of started for some reason it made her feel, it was her decompression somehow, but she would come home and start watching the news. Um, and I hadn't really been watching like network news in a long time. And I would just kind of be sitting there watching it. And it's just like, is this a satire of news? <laughs> like this doesn't even feel real. Like just the way this they talk, and just, everything is so <laughs> urgent and, you know, breaking news, no matter what it is. Just like, Oh my God. I just, <laughs> it's, 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 it's the, it's the red dot on your phone constantly just like trying to get you to keep right. you know tuning in or whatever um any any closing thoughts or anything i think it's probably about time to wrap this up i want to be respectful of your time uh no i think we've we've covered a lot of territory i just think you know people need to slow down when they're thinking of signing up for something and use their common sense and listen to their gut I like what you said about um, comparing it to buying a car, like just do your, your research and right. buyer beware, I guess. Is that the term? Yeah. Just don't be pushed into something. Mm. Okay. Well, um, yeah. your website is cultresearch.org. Is that? Yes. That yeah. Right? Or my name, yanyalalich.com. Either one works. Oh, it goes mm -hmm. to the same place. Yeah. Uh, and you've got several books out there. Is there one right. recent one that you're you'd like to... Talk well, about I, you know, I mentioned Take Back Your Life, but the other my most recent book is called Escaping Utopia, uh, Growing Up in a Cult, Getting Out and Starting Over, hmm. um, because that's certainly a phenomenon we've seen over the last decade or so of the, the kids who grew up in cults uh, leaving and trying to make their way in the world, which oftentimes they know nothing about. And, mm -hmm. and as a society, we don't have resources for them. Um, so there are a lot of suicides, a lot of troubled situations that occur. And um, it's one of my one of one of the areas I care a lot about right now. Um, okay. So that's another. So topic. there's resources for those people on your website or at least places to find. Yeah, you know. there. Yeah, I mean, the books, the books are there. The books are available on Amazon. They're mm -hmm. in audio or in print form. Um, and, you know, there's a, a lot of my writings and other stuff, checklists, all kinds of other things on the website. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for doing this. Okay. I was really looking Thank forward you. to it. I, I, I've seen you in so many different interviews and stuff. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I just, I got to talk to her because there's, there's just so much here. It just it never stops. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It was fun. Again, I would like to thank Dr. Yanya Lalich for her time. I really enjoyed this. And I can confirm that talking about difficult topics like cults is a lot easier when you have a puppy on your lap. So yeah, a little life hack there. But I want to thank her not just for her time, but for all she does for that matter, to help educate people about this issue and to help those who are trying to escape these situations that are frankly happening way more often than we think. Anyway, there are plenty of other interviews with her out there. You can go watch those or check out her books. She's written several, and they're all kind of seminal works in this field. And if you find yourself involved with or dealing with a cult in some way, there are all kinds of resources available at Yanya's website, cultresearch.org. So a couple of show notes. Uh, this is the second episode of the show. The first one with Andy Weir was posted just a little over a month ago. I do plan on keeping an every two weeks schedule going forward, but we did hit a little bit of a snag as we were taking care of some things behind the curtain. Uh, you might notice that the branding of this podcast feed has changed to reflect this new show that I'm doing. That's part of it. But anyway, a few bumps out of the gate, but we've already got a couple more of those recorded and we should be back on schedule soon. 
And we are still accepting music for the podcast. So if you're a musician and you think you can do a better intro jingle or a theme song than what you heard here, by all means, send it my way at answerswithjoe.com and it could wind up in a podcast. This is the part where I do need to apply best practices and ask if you're not subscribed to please consider subscribing to this podcast on your favorite podcast player. And if you are subscribed and some fact or story or thought in this podcast really stood out to you as super interesting, maybe share it with others. Throw a tweet out there. Annoy a coworker with it. Walk up to a guy at a urinal and whisper it in his ear. It all helps get the word out. Especially the urinal thing. I kind of really want someone to do the urinal thing now. Not to me, of course. Anyway, that should do it for this time. Thanks again to Dr. Lalich for taking time to talk with me. This episode was edited by Bray Brown with production support from Kimmy Britt. I'm Joe Scott. Thanks for listening. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And TBD, amazing closing line here. Take care, you guys.